Hey everybody, CT Hippo here. This is the second video in my series on searching for shipwrecks from your desktop. In the first part, we learned how to use Google Earth to import and map information from open source databases, as well as using the NOAA Bathymetry Viewer to verify the existence of wrecks. In this video, we'll learn how to extract data from the Bathymetry Viewer back into Google Earth and work with it there. For this project, I will be using two commercial programs to capture and edit images of my desktop. Specifically, I'm using Bandicam to capture screenshots of the Bathymetry Viewer site and FastStone Image Viewer to crop them. There are many other programs out there that will work for these tasks, and if you prefer another image capture and editing tool, feel free to use it. Both programs are available as free versions with limited functionality, and I'll leave links to them below. For our example, let's head back to Elliott Bay in Seattle and take a look at the big wreck in the eastern part of the bay. This is KML7910 in the ENC database, or 52502 in the AWIS dataset. Go ahead and pull it up in the bathymetry site at a zoom level where you can still see at least some of the shoreline nearby. Now we're going to use another feature of the bathymetry site and turn on the DEM color shaded relief layer. As you've probably noticed by now, the bathymetry data does not go all the way up to the shore, and this layer includes the shoreline itself as well as features on land that will help us line up the images we capture. As an interesting note, the DEM, or Digital Elevation Model Data, is collected by an aircraft flying overhead using a laser to map the terrain below. The laser is tuned to a special green color that penetrates water, meaning that they can also map the seafloor at the same time. Yes, this is as cool as it sounds. What the? Now, fire up Bandicam or whatever screen capture software you use and take a shot of the entire screen. To do this with Bandicam, select Full Screen Capture Mode, which is the square next to the game controller icon, and then image from the left panel. You can now minimize the program and when you hit the F10 key, it will take a picture of your screen and store it on a folder called Bandicam in the, your My Documents folder. Next, open that image in Fast Stone or whatever image editor you prefer, and we're going to cut out just the map portion of the image. In Fast Stone, this is done by double clicking on the image in the folder view to display it full screen, and then moving your cursor to the left to bring up the menu. Select Crop Board, and then use the tool to draw a box around the portion that you want to keep. Select Lossless Crop to File, where you want to save it, give it a name, and click Crop. While I'm in the software, I like to also use the Crop Board to cut out a small image of just the target, which we'll use later. So now we head back to Google Earth and it's time to import that image. From the top toolbar, select Add Image Overlay and select the image of the map you cropped earlier. What follows is a slow and sometimes frustrating process of aligning the image to the base map. Take your time with this and be careful to resize the image without changing its aspect ratio. This is very much a case of garbage in, garbage out, and if you aren't careful you can end up way off target. Once you have the overlay on screen, start by moving the transparency slider to the halfway mark or less so that you can see the base map through the image overlay. You can move the image around by grabbing the center cross and resize it using the corners. Then, it's just a matter of patience and persistence to get the overlay and base map lined up as carefully as possible. When you think you're in the correct location, you can check your work with things like piers and roads that extend from the base map into the overlay. When done correctly, these should line up on at least two sides of the overlay. Once you've lined it up as closely as possible, give it a name and click OK at the bottom of the box. Note that GE will save the overlay as an object just like location pins are stored, and you can show or hide it by clicking on the checkbox for that object. To get back to the dialog box, right click on the object and select properties from the bottom of the list. Now that we've imported the overlay and aligned it to the base map, we can start using the tools within GE to learn about the wreck. One of the first things to do is to turn on the AWIS or ENC layer and see just how close NOAA got with their pin. In this case, it looks like they dropped it right on what appears to be the bow. This step can serve as a reality check on your orthorectification. If the AWIS or ENC position is nowhere near the site on the overlay, you probably have the overlay aligned wrong. Let's start by measuring the target. Click on the ruler icon at the top of the toolbar and then the line tab. You can set your unit of measurement to whatever it works best for the job, including one based on an MIT freshman. Then. Simply start at one end, click and drag to the other, and release. This gives us a length of about 266 feet and a beam of about 60 feet. The ruler tool also gives us a line of bearing of about 250 degrees. You can use the lines of bearing from a point on the map to various fixed features on land for navigation purposes, but for most of us, GPS is good enough. Another thing you can do is drop pins at the bow and stern or other points of interest, which can give locations for setting anchors. 
to drop a pin, click on the push pin icon on the toolbar, and then drag and drop the tip of the marker onto the desired location. You can name the mark, change the appearance of the marker, and add notes, images, and links to the description. I use Google Earth as my database of recs I want to visit, and so when I find one through this process, I will copy the AWIS or ENC listing, paste it to a different folder, and add additional information to the object as I find it. I like to change the icon to a different one so that I can see which ones are modified, and I color code the icons by depth. Green ones are 60 feet or less, and yellow are 60 to 100 feet. But you can use any system you want. I will also take the close-up image of the bathymetry data that we captured earlier and import it into the pin description for a quick reference. GE accepts HTML and object descriptions, and if you're proficient with that language, you can create very involved notes. One final feature we can use is the polygon tool. Basically, we'll use it to trace around the outline of a rec to make it more visible when the overlay is turned off. This can be useful in very crowded areas where there are multiple recs and service features intermingled. By making the recs two-dimensional objects rather than just pins, it can be much easier to understand where they are in relation to their surroundings. To use it, click on the Add Polygon tool next to the push pin on the toolbar. Like any object in GE, you can give it a name and record information about the object within the description. To draw the polygon, simply start at a point and carefully trace the outline of the object. You can then change the color of the outline and fill. In this series, we've learned to use online open source tools to find, catalog, and measure shipwrecks. These same tools can be used for many other activities. For example, you can import historical maps into GE in the same way and use them to find abandoned places. This series is something of an experiment for me. I have lots of information on this subject to share, but these videos are fairly time intensive to make. And so, if you're interested in this kind of thing, please let me know. Until then, let's go have an adventure.